Aha! I've got you now. I'll tap my council room for three posh manor, and then I'll play my Michael, the singing Duke of Hot Takington. He hits you for six John Mayer damage. Well, <laughs> I heal the damage by using my Amanda Cow, the Duchess of the Bonaire Free Zone, and then I discount two Klaus cards to get six suave counters, which I then place upon my peak card, the Pondering Duke of Lethel, and then he uses his Lethery powers to cut off your stupid cowboy economy. <laughs> well, I sure wish I had better news for you. My great coat Sarah, the King Cyclone, uses her ability to counter that econ attack and send it over to Posh. And then I draw four cards and discard two to play my Sir Alex Barker, leader of the Howlers. Curse you, you cad. Without my economy, I can't play my Calvin, Duke of Ruin. Oh, that was my shortest path to victory. All I can do now is, is spend my three gift tokens to untap my forum. Suave Allen, why don't you come over here and play at the table? Because I am eating this chicken wing, you British bagel. Fine. I will steal your forum and then I will place a gift token upon it, which then allows me to bring out my duo of Sir Brittany, the Knight of Athena, and Sir Laurie, the Electric Knight, who will both then attack you for 10 combined lightning and wisdom damage. <laughs> Ho, ho, ho. Uh, hold on there, Suavo. By using the combination of lightning and wisdom damage, you just left yourself open to one of them coup de graces. Oh, ho, ho. All I gotta do now is discard my whole hand and spend two Albert Darrow dollars, and that lets me activate my Duchess Noel, Duchess of House Stark. Now play your last pathetic card. My grandpa's deck has no pathetic cards, Kaiba. Hi guys, welcome back to the Library of Alexandria. And today, guys, today, I <laughs> come to you with my July wrap-up. Oh, no, no, no. Don't, don't struggle to check your calendar. It is, in fact, in the 20th something day of August, which really is inexcusable. I apparently live in a dimension where time has no meaning. I should have just gone ahead and said, oh yeah, I filmed this like August 1, and I just haven't had a chance to get it out. No, like it's August 20, it's August 23rd, literally right now while I'm filming this. I don't know when it's gonna come out, but August 23rd is when I'm filming it. Uh, it's almost time for my, for my September TBR, and I'm sitting here with my August, oh, my, sorry, my July wrap up. I know, I know, guys, like I know, like, <laughs> I know. I know, there's, there's no reason for it, there's no excuse for it, other than I just didn't do it because I, school started and you know, other crap came out, but I had other videos, I just, you know, didn't do this one. So, it is time for that time late in the following month where I wrap up the things that I read uh, over a month ago. And I also talk about the things that, you know, I was watching and, you know, the things that I was doing in that previous month. So, let's go ahead and get this started without wasting any more time. The month of July was not super great reading for me, really, which is, I mean, it was, it was simultaneously excellent and, you know, not super great. I had um, my friend Leanna's uh, TBR challenge where she chose my TBR, which in the future, four books is too many for me to try to read in one month from someone else, but I am slowly working my way through that. I also had a friend in town uh, who was in town for two weeks, which, you know, disrupted my reading while still being awesome because I got to hang out with my buddy. And also my wife and I went on an early anniversary trip uh, to Cedar Point, which has so many roller coasters that it's obscene and was super, super fun. Uh, but obviously, you know, I'm not reading while I'm on my vacation, really. So, all of that conspired, and I only read about 2,000 pages, which is pretty low uh, from what I usually read, especially considering, like, one of those books, like, kind of stretched into, into August. So, really, all 2,000 of those weren't actually read in the month of July. But I read a total of five things. I read one novella and four books. And of those five things that were read, I read one 
one star, wah, wah, wah. one two and a half star, one three and a half star, one four and a half star, and then but a one of them was a rocking five stars. So not a great month for the five star strumpet king. But let's go ahead and get into uh, those things that I read again from worst to best. So my one star read was in fact my novella. It is called The Siege of Tilpur. It is the first novella in uh, the Powder Mage series. All of the Powder Mage novellas take place before the first book, Promise of Blood, uh, except for one that takes place between books one and two. And The Siege of Tilpur is it is one of the later ones written. It was written in 2018, so four years after Promise of Blood. And it is about a siege of a desert town where uh, Captain Tomas, who we see in Promise of Blood as one of our main POVs, and who is one of the best characters in Promise of Blood, here he is but a sergeant, and, you know, he commits this big act of heroism, and, you know, that's how he starts down his path of promotion. Now, the novella is only like 30-something pages, and... I gave it one star because, like, I don't like really being mean, but it's not very good is the problem. Like, it's just not very good. And it frustrates me that this is literally four years after Promise of Blood, and yet it's not any better than Promise of Blood. In fact, it's worse than Promise of Blood. And it just seems really thrown together. Nothing really seems thought about or meticulous. It all just seems very, the first thing that came to Brian McClellan's head is the first thing that he wrote down. This desert siege of an impenetrable city is done significantly better in uh, Bernard Cornwell's Sharp series. Read the first three books, Tiger, Triumph, and Fortress, if you want to see what is trying to be done here, done well. And the main problem with it is that it is riddled with cliches. You don't actually need to read this story to know how it goes. From the general who literally like doesn't, you know, is like, oh no, I know it's best, <laughs> like, and who just ignores suggestions by his subordinates because he kind of knows what's best, to the underling who knows that the general's a fool and has a plan and is frustrated that the higher ups won't listen to him and so he enacts it. Uh, anyway, or gets permission from a middling, a middling officer to go do that and saves the day. And it, it's, it's just, it is just not very good. Like every single cliche that you can think of in a story like this exists. It's as if McClellan said, like, thought of the first line of dialogue that came to his head, which obviously would be the cliche dialogue. We all think of that's the first thing that would come to my head, but then didn't actually fix it. There's a time where the middling officer, the lieutenant, is talking to the general and talking about Tomas's, you know, harebrained plan to, as a powder mage, go into the this, you know, impenetrable fortress that they haven't been able to take via the walls. So he's gonna, he wants to do this night raid where just him and a couple... A couple powder mages will go in and then they'll sneak out through the well or whatever. And, you know, the lieutenant's like, yeah, and we have a Sergeant Tomas and the general literally, guys, he literally, I'm not exaggerating, says these words, Tomas, Tomas, hmm, where have I heard that name before? And that's, that's the most cliche thing that you could possibly say in that situation. And I'm just like, you are a best-selling author. You can do better than this. And it's just so frustrating. And that's why I have a holy war with Brian McClellan, because his setting is so amazing. Like, the setting and the premise behind what he's doing, and the, the, the intent, and what he's trying to do is amazing. And it does shine out in some of the action sequences. But it's just stuff like this. Like, just take time and go back and write better dialogue. Just write better dialogue. And, you know, that continues into, you know, after it succeeds, because of course it succeeds, and the general's like, well, we obviously can't give, we can't give too much credit to the peasant, so... <laughs> and it's like, of course, of course. And also, it doesn't make any sense. So it's raining when Tomas assaults the, the, the fortress, and because it's raining, the impenetrable fortress that knows an, an opposing army is out there doesn't have any guards, because it's raining. And I am certain that that is not how 
guard duty works. I am certain that if it is a fortress and there is an enemy army outside that has already multiple times tried to take your fortress, that just because it's raining, they don't rein in the guards. That guard just stands out there in the rain. Like, that sucks, but they don't not guard their walls because of rain. Like, what civilization would do that? And so it's just filled with stuff that just isn't really believable. Again, if you want a siege of, a, of an impenetrable desert city, uh, just read, like, read the first three sharp books. So it's not great. Good news, good news. Uh, the next Brian McClellan uh, Powder Mage novel that I read, uh, that I've already read, because again, it's the end of August, is actually quite good. So before, before you, you think that I am being unfair to my ranger class marked target, I am, I am not, I am not. Forsworn is actually quite good, as you will hear in my August wrap up sometime uh, mid-December. Next up on the list, uh, two and a half stars is Boosh. Ember in the Ashes by Saba Tahir. So, this is a frustrating one because uh, a lot of it is kind of inspired by Rome. Like, all the names are very Roman and a lot of things that are inspired by Rome. Uh, there is this civilization called, you know, the Empire that has taken over this class of people called the Scholars and has, you know, like, oppressed them. And there's this, there's this academy for uh, these people people that wear masks, and they're like, you know, the crack inquisitors of the Empire. And one of the scholar girls, uh, Laia, her brother is killed, and as vengeance, she joins the Resistance, because there's always a Resistance, and ends up uh, infiltrating the school as the slave of the head of the school, who is named the Commandant, who is uh, one of the worst villains in uh, recent memory. Because she's not really believable, it's it's just it's literally kick the puppy trope, where it's like, what are the what unreasonable things can I have this person do to show how evil they are? And it, it like it, it it comes out of nowhere. It's not developed like evil evil people doing horrible things is fine, but it needs to come from somewhere, and it needs to feel like it's a realistic reaction to someone in this position, as opposed to just being like, how can I show the audience how evil this person is so they'll understand how cruel this person is. And it, it just doesn't land. Like, the Commandant is absolutely an insane person that a competent Empire would never leave in charge of anything because she is the most, she's incredibly inefficient with her random acts of cruelty. Like, it just doesn't make any sense. You're welcome to watch my review to learn more if you want. Uh, but uh, Tahir's writing is excellent. Uh, it is a YA novel, so I mean, like, it, it, it wasn't written for me to start with. The protagonists are young. I liked Elias more than Laia. I did not like the insta-love that was flitting around between Laia and all of the other people who are, you know, dealing with insta-love, love quadrangles, whatever. But her writing is excellent. Uh, Tahir's writing is really good. Uh, and so I, I read it very, very quickly because it is not, it is not hard to read. It's not badly written. I just, I just didn't like the storyline and I didn't like really a lot of things that happened. Like another, I, I, I'm so sick of the murderous bully trope. I'm so sick of the murderous bully trope. And there's literally a character in the school who is, you know, obviously an antagonist. He's the murderous bully that literally every single time he is on screen, uh, he threatens to murder the men. Like, so if it's Elias there, he's like, oh, I'm gonna, I'd be so great to slit your throat. And if there's a woman on page instead, he's like, oh, it'd be so great to rape you, literally. And I'm, I'm not exaggerating. Every single time he's on the page, he's threatening to rape the women and he's threatening to kill the men. And it's just like, again, that's not subtle, that's not an interesting, it's not a compelling villain, it's just, it's just annoying. And so my, my big problem with this, I would have gladly given this three, maybe three and a half stars. It lost at least half, possibly to a full star, with just not having interesting, interesting villains. Um, Laia's fine, I don't dislike her. Elias, I think, is the more interesting of the two protagonists. The most interesting to me is Helene, who is a classmate of, of Elias's and is much more like for the Empire, and she's not even a POV in this one. I have a feeling that she is a POV in the next book, uh, which I am going to read. I'm interested enough to see how the plot progresses, even though Klaus has told me I absolutely should not. But Charmaine and Angela have told me that I, I should keep reading. So I'll get to it eventually, uh, especially since Charmaine sent me friggin' Torch Against the Night, the second book. If I didn't have it, it's easy to be like, well, I guess I'm never going to read the second one. I just don't know when I'm going to be able to get to it. So again, if you like YA that is, that is well written and has a pretty compelling story, like this is for you. Like if you don't mind uh, younger protagonists and love triangles and kind of insta-love, again, 
this is for you. It is interesting. The, the, the villain characters just broke it for me. Like, they just broke it for me. Next on the list, and this is three and a half stars, Boosh the Wolf by Leo Carew. So, this was the Shelf Space Book Club pick for July, and uh, my co-host was Leanna, who also, you know, assigned me to read this book. And uh, if you missed the live show, it's right there, where we'll talk both non-spoilers and spoilers. But this book had so much potential, and I am very confident that the next book, The Spider, is going to be, will be at least four stars, because much of my problems in The Wolf came in the first third of the book. And ju he just like kind of stopped doing it in the, the, the back two thirds. It is like an alternate history. It's a, it's a fantasy book, but it's also kind of an alternate history. Like it takes place in Albion. Like it takes place actually in our Britain. They're just not called the Britons really, but it's still the same place. So Liana informed us, at, and it's super interesting that uh, Keru is an anthropologist by trade, and so he is writing these northern people called the Anakim are as if, uh, what if the Neanderthals evolved alongside, you know, Homo sapiens? And so the, the southerners are kind of like, you know, what we think of as the, they're our human race, our, our normal humans. But then you've got the Anakim who are kind of a combination of the Neanderthals. They definitely have some Spartan in them and also like Norse uh, influence as well. And they're just like these like really huge, like almost giant-like race that have these tough like bony plates underneath their skin. And there's also a third race of giants elsewhere on here that is just like not messed with very often. Um, I forget what, what they're called as well. But it implies that those, the race of giants are kind of descended from, from the Nephilim, where when the, the angels that were cast down from heaven mated with uh, the humans and formed this new race of kind of like half angel, half giant type thing. And so all of that is really interesting. And this is a military fantasy. If you like military fantasy, that's all this is. It's cool getting to see two commanders go head to head. You have the commander, the young commander of the Anakim who's trying to prove himself, um, Roper, versus the commander kind of of the Southerners uh, named Bellamus. And he's not really the commander because he's a commoner and, you know, nobles have to command. That's how it, that's how it is. And watching them go head to head is very interesting. The, there's a lot of political intriguing, but most of that comes from the fact that uh, Roper has uh, the head of kind of like the chief war band among the Anakim is this guy named Uvorin, who does not want Roper to be the new Black Lord. And so they are kind of like going head to head. And Uvorin is a great antagonist. Like he is fantastic. One of the things I loved the most about it. And so they're constantly at war. The whole, the whole thing is really kind of at war and then what's taking place between Roper and Uvorin back among the Anakim between battles. Bellamus's story is slightly less interesting. It might have been better if we got kind of more of his POVs. The faults in this book come from the fact that it's Keru's first novel, and a lot of times he feels like he doesn't trust the reader. He will tell you something. Uh, for example, there's this, this, this trick that one of the armies plays on another one, and it, it has this bi these big results, and later on, like, like, you know, 15 pages later, someone refers to it kind of tangentially, like, like, alludes to it. And rather than assuming that we remember the trick that literally just happened, because it was a huge deal, he tells us again, he says, he, he said, referring to this, the, this, like, no, we know that. And he does that all the time. He, ha he repeats information that we were told, like, just, like, 20 pages ago, as if he doesn't trust us to remember that these things happen or remember who this person is. And it's really noticeable, at least for me. They also call Bellamus upstart because he's not a noble and is kind of like rising to power. They literally, in all narration and in all dialogue, call him upstart. And it's so annoying. It's so annoying. And the other weird thing is that every single time like a new band of, of, of Anakim come on or a new like hero of the Anakim come on, they're like the greatest warrior you've ever seen. And it's, at some point it gets hard to figure out who's the actual greatest warrior because it's like, oh, everyone's afraid to fight this guy. Oh, this guy was so fast. He was just such an amazing warrior. Oh my, and it's just like, which, which one of them is the actual best? And so that's not the best. Like his writing is not fantastic, but it does improve over the course of the novel. And a lot of that, like, 
setup stuff has been done in this book. And so I'm eager to see where it's going to go in the spider. Some of the stuff that I've been told by Leanna or others that have read it that is in the spider, but not in this one, really appeals to me. There's one kind of like setup antagonist that is in this one that is it is the title spider and i'm really eager to see what kind of decisions made in one screw them over in two so i will be reading the spider i, I definitely liked it enough to continue but if you like military fantasy and you think it, you know anthropology is interesting you absolutely should read the wolf next up my four and a half star read boosh a time of dread by john gwynn this is book one in the of blood and bone trilogy which is a sequel to the faithful and the Fallen. So I've already had a, a live show discussion about this with the Faithful and the Fallen crew, which is, let's see if I can remember everybody. Philip, Abby, Patrick, Jimmy, Sarah, Alex. Yes, there are seven of us and I named six. I am the seventh one. And uh, I really liked it. Like this actually is my favorite of John Gwynn's first books. And I just liked the narrower story it tells. It tells a much smaller story. We only have four POVs instead of the, you know, many, 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 many we have in Malice. And I like, I think I like the, you know, I like the, the, the characters in Malice a little better, but I think I liked uh, Time of Dread, just its focus better. I like the stuff that it deals with, kind of religious zealotry, religious-based militant groups, and kind of like f factions within the good guys. Like, I like it when there's like two good guys, but those two good guy organizations don't actually, you know, like each other or trust each other. I kind of like that. I like that it focused on just a, a few people and that there was a kind of a mystery at its core. Um, I really love Drem. The character Drem is uh, on the spectrum and I love, like, I just love representation of um, people on the spectrum. It's just, it's not something that, you know, I don't really think about it when I'm reading uh, fantasy novels. I'm not like, man, I wish there was, you know, people who like thought like me in books. But then when I see it, I'm like, oh, I do think just like that guy. Like I saw a lot of um, how uh, how my mind works in Drem. And especially when I was, when I was younger before, you know, you learn kind of to uh, having Asperger's, you learn kind of how to cope with, uh, with what society expects of you, societal expectations or, um, and everything. And it was definitely a build-up book. I liked it, I think, more than, more than others, but there were some shocking twists and turns in this. I am super excited to see where Time of Blood goes. And I just thought that some of the stuff it says about, you know, like how much freedom are you kind of willing to lose as protection from literally the enemy, like literally people who are trying to murder you and absolutely will. Like, are you willing to give up some of your freedoms in order that those people who would tear you apart and kill everyone and everyone you love, like, are you willing to sacrifice some of your personal freedom in order to keep those things at bay? Like, it's not, it's not like, Oh, well, you know, we don't even know if they, yeah, you do. Like, they definitely know. They, like, they, these guys are definitely going to come kill you. But I, I can't say too, too much about it because it does pick up uh, at, after the end of uh, Faithful and the Fallen. It's 137 years later, so uh, things are different. But similar, we get to see, you know, it references things that happened in uh, Faithful and the Fallen. We have one character that was alive then because she's from a long, a long lived race. And then, of course, like a sequel trilogy would not be a sequel trilogy if it didn't have a descendants of those original heroes, which is, which is just freaking awesome. So I really, really liked Time of Dread, and I'm excited to continue with this series. And now before I get to my five-star book, talk about the stuff that I watched. Um, I didn't watch a ton. I mean, I finished Veronica Mars that I was watching and watched the movie, which was excellent. And, you know, the first episode of season four, it's all I've seen, uh, where Logan stops being the worst. And now Veronica is like, it's like, Veronica, what are you doing? What are you doing? I've been, while editing and stuff, I've been watching House. I think your argument is specious. I think your tie is ugly. Uh, for like, you know, I don't know, the sixth time I've watched through House. I love House. I just, like, I just love House. I hate that he becomes well, everything he becomes in the later seasons where he just becomes a maniac instead of just a misanthrope. Whatever. Um, as far as playing, I finished Dark Souls 3. Got the plat. <laughs> And Dark Souls 3, like I love Dark Souls games. I love Dark Souls games, the Souls games. I like Bloodborne better. I think I think Bloodborne is is a better game. I think I just like the aesthetic better, and I like uh, I like how fast it is. But I really liked Dark Souls 3. I like that the From Software games allow you to uh, you can grind if you need to. Like I'm not super good at video games, right? Like so I'm. 
there, there is a certain threshold of, of good that I can get, right? And so I like that I can, if I, if I struggle, I can just grind, like increase my, you know, my health bar to like freaking right here. <laughs> and it's still hard because, you know, I'm not super good at dodging crap, so I can still eat some attacks. I still have to dodge because it's still freaking hard. But I do like that I can still do it. Like, I, like whatever, fine. If you killed Nameless King on your 30 soul level, good for you. Here's, here is the, uh, the round of applause. Uh, apply for a Corona Civica and I'll have one sent to you. Good work. I don't care. Like, I, I finished my, my New Game Plus Plus playthrough on, like, level 215. Don't care. Don't care. It was still hard, and I, I was able to do it. I struggled with Nameless King the first time I beat him. Was, I think, the hardest boss I fought. I, super, I got super fortunate at Dark Eater Madeir, which apparently is the hardest boss in the game. Ah. From what I understand. And he was hard. I just don't know how. I got lucky. I didn't get hit a bunch. I was able to dodge the patterns. I was able to hit him, and I, I was able to kill Dark Eater Madeira on like my third try, which is, which is madness. And I'm glad I didn't have to struggle with it. My buddy Finn, boo boo boo, knocked his head up against the wall on Dark Eater Madeira uh, a couple times, um, you know. But that was his amygdala, like the the Chalice Dungeon amygdala from Bloodborne. That was hard. Took like 40 tries, so it was fun. But it's super fun. I just like I, like I like the challenge, and I like when it's done to be like, yes, like I did it. And I don't understand the storyline of Dark Souls, but I really like that Vati, Vati Vidya has lore videos that I can just watch and be like, oh yeah, I didn't get any of that, but thank you for, for filling, filling me in. Just the aesthetic, it's just gorgeous. Like the environments and the, the level design and the, it's just, I mean, it's a beautiful game. Uh, this is one of the reasons that I don't think I'm gonna play Sekiro because I don't think you can grind to get better in Sekiro. If, 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 if you can, if in Sekiro you can, you can grind to get better, let me know and then I'll play it. But if you can't, like, again, like, I, there, is, there is X amount of good that can be gotten by me. And so the best book I read this month, five stars, was Boosh, and that is the Book of Babel uh, by Josiah Bancroft. This is book four of the Books of Babel, and this is an, an arc that I received uh, from Orbit. Thank you so much to uh, Orbit and Angela, the, the public, Orbit publicist, and Josiah Bancroft himself. Thank you so much for um, arranging for me to get this. Like, it's like, ugh, I'm, just, I'm just floored that I got to read it because Senlin Ascends was the first book that I hadn't already read that I read for BookTube, and it just transformed how I just did my videos because I loved it so much that it just, it began the so good thing. And it's just, it's just fantastic. I can't say a lot about this because my full review will be out in September, closer to release, but it is a fantastic conclusion. The, the writing is stellar as always. Bancroft's prose is second to none. The character moments in this book are phenomenal. The action moments in this book are phenomenal. To me, it feels like a combination of Arm of the Sphinx and Hod King in just kind of its, its style and structure. We find out a lot of lore that we've been waiting to find out. Some questions are answered, some questions are not, but it is an absolute fitting conclusion, even if it may not be the conclusion you might think you're in store for. It's just good, and it's, and it's heartbreaking at parts, and it's touching and joyous at parts, and infuriating at parts, and surprising at parts, but there are some of the best character moments uh, in the series in here, and I, you know, found myself weeping more than once. There are so many good quotes just about, about Senlin himself, and about the nature of tyranny, and the nature of despots, and the nature of of servitude, and it's just, it's a fantastic book. Uh, please tune in uh, probably September 1 when my actual full review of The Fall of Babel comes out. If you haven't already picked up this series, please, there's time to do it before November. When Fall of Babel actually comes out, please read it. Like, you, I mean, you have to deal with f f feckless, gormless protagonists like Senlin. I mean, Senlin is not your tough guy. More than anything, this series is real people. People that we know being placed into like extraordinary circumstances and how they would we react. And a lot of times they react the exact same way we would react, which is to say poorly. And you're just like, what are you doing? Why are you behaving this way? But you should absolutely go out and pre-order Fall of Babel if you have not already. 
absolutely fantastic, absolutely fantastic series with a fantastic conclusion. So guys, that is it for me this month. What is the favorite, what is your favorite thing that you read in July? Um, have any of you guys, you know, played Dark Souls 3? Do you enjoy the Souls games? Uh, are you someone who can beat Nameless King on Souls level 34? Is Sekiro a game that I can grind? Let me know in the comments uh, your favorite book or what you played in this past month. Guys, as always, information about my Patreon and Discord is down in the description, and I'll see you next time, guys. Thank you.